Hello, welcome to Compositium, a channel dedicated to composition and orchestration. I was planning to do a video on orchestrating a piece by Beethoven for the woodwind section of the orchestra, but since these videos are aimed at beginning orchestrators, I realized that I would first need to explain how the woodwind section works. When I first ask my students to produce an orchestration for woodwinds, they often make the same mistake. They treat them the way they treat strings, and that doesn't work for many reasons. The first mistake they make is that, in a four-part harmony, they give the first voice to the flutes in unison, the second to the oboes, the third to the clarinets, and the fourth to the bassoons. I'm not saying this is never done, but in general, it is very ineffective. First of all, there's a problem with the playing ranges. Woodwind instruments have smaller ranges than strings, so given the first voice to the flutes, the second to the oboes, and so on, we'll force the flutes and oboes to play in the lower parts of their ranges most of the time, as generally music tends to center around the middle register. The above brings us to the second problem with that approach, dynamic curves. String instruments can be asked to play any dynamics anywhere in their range. Of course, the fourth string produces a thicker sound than the first string, but that's something else. The balance in a four-part harmony for strings will not be affected by the register in which each instrument is played, but this is not the case for the woodwinds. Each instrument in the woodwind family has four registers, although a few authors maintain that some instruments have three. These registers are known as low, middle, high, and altissimo, and the dynamic possibilities are different for each. Here we must make a differentiation between relative and absolute dynamics. The former refers to those applicable to any instrument when played alone. You can write soft and loud dynamics in any register in the range of a woodwind instrument. They will not be the same between different registers or even extremes of a given register, but different nuances will definitely be obtained. The possibilities of a forte in the low register of the flute, for example, are very limited, but that doesn't mean that we cannot write a forte in that register it will not sound as loud as a forte in the altissimo register, but if the instrument is solo or if the accompaniment's dynamics is properly controlled, there should be no problem. However, if what we want is to combine several woodwinds together to form a polyphonic choir, we have to consider only the absolute dynamics, a single intensity scale according to which the dynamic possibilities of each register of the instruments are organized. So, considering only absolute dynamics, the flute is capable of producing a real forte only in the high and altissimo registers. Here are the dynamic curves of flutes, oboes, clarinets, and bassoons based on absolute dynamics. This is all approximate, of course, and may differ between players and instrument brands. One interesting thing that you may notice is that both oboes and bassoons gain strength as they go down, not as they go up, this is a feature of all double reed instruments. In addition, the clarinet has a flatter curve than the rest, and is capable of strong dynamics in its slow register. So, whenever we are writing for woodwinds, we have to consider what dynamics are possible in the register we want to use them in. This makes writing for them much more complicated than writing for strings. Another problem with each pair of instruments playing a single line is that two woodwinds playing in unison are never perceived as a single timbre, as with a section of the strings. They are always kept somewhat separate in our mind. You may now wonder why we don't have 16 flutes in an orchestra. The answer is that if we did, we would also have to increase the number of strings. Each section of the orchestra has a number of players, such that the dynamic balance between all is more or less assured. Also, 16 flutes or oboes don't really produce the unified color of a string section. The main reason is that their intonation is too precise. If you want the thick sound that a string section produces, you need differences in intonation. Not too much, of course, but that's the secret. That is also the reason why the same thing happens with a choir. Of course, woodwind players can alter the intonation if they wish, but since they study their whole life to produce the best intonation possible, it is something that has to be forced, whereas on the strings or in a choir, these small differences occur naturally. In fact, various virtual instruments rely on this to recreate the sound of a string section. 
they simulate several instruments playing together and slightly alter the intonation of each. The result is that lush sound of the strings that we all love. The next thing to consider when orchestrating for woodwind is color. If I gave you four oil paints, would you mix them all and paint with the result? Or would you try to make different combinations and also use some colors separately? Why produce something like this, when you can do this? Much more interesting, don't you think? Of course, mixing them all together is not bad at all, but the result is quite uniform, not to say monotonous. Not wrong if that's what you're looking for in a specific work, but pretty boring if you use it over and over again. One of the characteristics of the woodwind family is that it is a more heterogeneous group than the strings. It has four basic colors and even some shades if we take into account the differences between the registers and other instruments such as piccolo or cor anglais. So why do we have at least two of each and not just one? There are several reasons for that. One of them, of course, is that with just one, it's impossible to have a chord in close harmony if the outer voices are too far apart. The instruments would be widely spaced and the result would be a slightly hollow sound. The strings can be subdivided, so this is not a problem for them. Additionally, with more than one instrument of each type, you can alternate between them, which in the case of woodwinds may occasionally be necessary because breathing can only last a limited time, obviously, and because the musicians get tired not only of blowing, but also of keeping their embouchure steady. So the next reason for not combining all the woodwinds, at least when not necessary, is fatigue. Try blowing into a tube for long periods of time and you'll find yourself getting tired very quickly. Of course, wind players practice their entire lives to save their breath and make it last as long as possible, and also to keep their embouchure steady, but even with all that practice they will obviously run out of air and get tired of holding various muscles tight on their faces for extended periods of time. Although the comparison is not precise, you really have to consider each woodwind instrument as equal to a single section of the strings, at least in soft dynamics, and if the notes played by the woodwinds are not located in problematic registers. In strong dynamics, or when the part of some instruments have been written in an unfavorable register, you would have to combine at least two woodwinds, of the same timbre or better if they're different, to balance with the strings. Therefore, when orchestrating for the woodwind section, we try to play with color, rather than using all the instruments together, although that's possible, especially on a loud tutti. This is a more common and much more interesting solution than that. It also creates a very interesting and desirable effect, which is of course possible on the strings but less noticeable, a kind of dialogue, as if the instruments are conversing with each other, some asking a question here, others answering there. Also, take a look at the work on dynamics, much more musical, don't you think? A good woodwind orchestration takes all of the above into account. We will use only a limited number of instruments in a passage and then switch them over to a different group, perhaps keeping one or two for a while, but then removing them some time later as well. This will produce a sound that varies over time and feels more colorful. In some passages, especially loud ones, we may use the full ensemble and then return to smaller groups when the music calls for it. I hope you now have a better understanding of how the woodwind section of the orchestra works. I've tried to cover all the important considerations about orchestrating for these instruments. The rest will emerge when I show you an example, which will be next week. Another work by Beethoven that works perfectly on woodwinds. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Take care. Ciao.